Alphonsus Liguri, and he's talking about the resurrection and the Eucharist. And I looked at that name and I thought, this is lovely because it continues a theme uh, that has been referred to so many times during this convention, including uh, the references, of course, by our last speaker, the astronaut, the, the Eucharist and how much it means. But um, I was very fortunate to be able to be given some program notes when I arrived on Friday. Uh, and the man I introduced to you is Father Brian Johnston. He was actually uh, a distinguished international academic. He is known in academia as Professor Brian Johnston, one of the foremost theologians in his own speciality in this time and age. And thank God he is with us today. Professor Brian Johnston. How's that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to begin with a reflection on an experience that you no doubt have had and that quite probably you will have later today. When you receive the Lord in communion, you experience within you a deep devotion, a strengthening of faith, new courage to go out and talk to others about the Lord, new power to overcome evil, evil in yourself, and to confront evil in the world. Now that experience is an experience of the risen Lord, an experience of the same power, the divine power of the Spirit, which raised Jesus from the dead. So that is an experience that's waiting for you today. Now, to make sense of that experience, we can go to the scriptures and specifically to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And you remember the passage. There are two disciples on the road. They're talking to one another. They're discussing recent events in Jerusalem. They are joined by a stranger. We know who the stranger is. It's Jesus. They don't know. And as one of the translations of the Bible says, something prevented their recognizing him. So one of the questions is that runs through our mind, what was it? What was this something that prevented their recognizing him? The solution is yet to come. The men then report to the stranger that, as they say, some women had a vision, or say they had a vision of an angel who told them that he was alive. He means Jesus. Some went to the tomb and found that it was just as the women said, but they did not see him. They still can't see him. So the men do not believe the women. That's the first answer to why they couldn't understand why they couldn't see, why they couldn't acknowledge the resurrection. Then they, the scene continues. Jesus then instructs them in the scriptures and shows them that the whole of salvation history in former ages 
was a lead up to the events in which they are now participating. So, the Bible. Then he makes to go on and they persuade him to stay. And while they're together, he took, takes bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes are opened. And they said to one another, this is chapter 24, verse 32. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? They recognize the risen Jesus in the breaking of the bread. So when later today in the Mass we reenact that breaking of the bread and when you receive the Lord in the appearance of bread you'll have the same experience. You may find your heart burning within you. That's what this talk is about. That's what the Gospel of Luke is about. But then, as we read in the Gospel, he vanished from them. We might say, he vanished from their physical sight, but came to them now in the new sight of faith. They have come to faith in the risen Jesus the very same fate, faith that we share today. Then they rush off back to Jerusalem to tell others of what they had seen and experienced. So we have there the three essential moments of faith in the risen Jesus. <clears throat> the scripture first of all the breaking of the bread the Eucharist and thirdly mission we can only receive and give faith in the risen Lord if we give it to somebody else and that is what we will do when we share the Eucharist this evening. Sharing a faith in the risen Lord, and that is possible because we are all moved by the power of the risen Lord. That's the experience, and that's how we identify what it means to believe in the risen Lord and how we understand the relationship between the Eucharist and the resurrection. Now, we Catholics use many titles when we speak of the Eucharist and there are two, just two, that I want to concentrate on. One is the Eucharist as a memorial of Christ's passion, or the Eucharist as sacrifice, in other words, or the Eucharist as a memorial of Christ's resurrection. And my suggestion is that the two go together. You can't understand one without the other. You can't have the resurrection without the death of Jesus. And the death of Jesus without the resurrection would end in emptiness and nothingness. So those two key ideas go together. Now, in the course of a history of our faith, many Christians concentrated on the first. 
the memorial of the passion. And the reason seems to have been like this, that we understand that Jesus' passion, his sacrifice for us on the cross, was necessary to win for us salvation from our sins, which is of course true. So we put great importance on the death on the cross of Jesus, but it was somewhat more difficult to see exactly what Jesus' resurrection did for us. And, and so it happened that for centuries the resurrection was not given such a central place in Christian doctrine and Christian understanding. And over recent decades there has been a growing awareness in the Catholic Church and in other churches of the need to recapture faith in the importance and the centrality of the resurrection of the Lord. That's what I'm assisting you to do this evening. Now the way I'm going to do that is to reflect on the Eucharistic prayers and I'm doing that because these are the prayers that you actually hear when you say and participate in the Eucharist. Now there are, there are at present four principal Eucharistic prayers and I'm going to take them briefly one after the other. The first is a very ancient one in its present form that the one you hear, we hear in the first Eucharistic prayer as it's called. And that goes back to 1570 to the, what's called the Mass of Pius V. And that was the basis of the Mass, as we now have it, the Mass of Paul VI in the form of the first Eucharistic prayer. You may not hear that so often. It's very often invoked on special occasions. This is what that prayer says. And I quote, Father, we celebrate the memory of Christ your Son. We, your people and your ministers, recall his passion, his descent among the dead, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into glory. And from the many gifts you have given us, we offer to you, God of glory and majesty, this holy and perfect sacrifice the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. Now we can see here very clearly the basic key ideas. Let's take them one by one. First of all, we pray, we say, we celebrate. We do not simply remember it's not like remembering an event from the past. It's a celebration that every liturgy is an enactment. Christ is acting in each Eucharist and we are acting in the Eucharist. And we can do so because Christ is acting within us. It is very important to note those words at the end of that Eucharistic prayer. It says, as I quoted, from the many gifts you have given us, we offer to you, God of glory and majesty, 
this holy and perfect sacrifice, the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. So the prayer casts all our thoughts in the context of the giving and receiving of gifts. God gives us gifts, the gift of his son Jesus Christ above all, and we thereby are enabled to give gifts to God. It's, it's an extraordinary thought, isn't it? We can give gifts to God. Now, of course, God doesn't need our gifts. We are gifted precisely in giving gifts to God. It's we who are changed. Now, if we move on to the text again, we recall his passion, his death on the cross, his sacrifice for us, and then we come to another idea which may not be so familiar, his descent among the dead. This is a very ancient idea. It's not strange to you when you say the Apostles Creed when we speak of Jesus Christ and we say his descent into hell strange idea but it's there in the mass and it's there in the creed so it's, it's worth thinking about now a clarification is necessary the hell into which Jesus descends doesn't mean hell as the place or situation of those who have definitively rejected God. It's the ancient idea of Hades or Sheol. And the belief was that the souls who had lived before Jesus could not attain salvation until he had brought about salvation, so they had to wait, and that's where they waited, in Sheol. So what is being said here is that Jesus, after his death, descended into the realm of the dead, and of course from there rose. Now this is the major notion of the resurrection in the Eastern churches. They portray the resurrection in many icons. They're magnificent and beautiful icons. There is great variety among them, but they all share basically the same form. No doubt you have seen them. And I've noted over the last 20 years that this image of the Eucharist, of the resurrection, is becoming much more widespread in the West also. So it, it's a description of like this, that at the base of the image is, is a black pit, hell. We can think of our moments when we feel life is hell. I'm sure you sometimes felt like that. When we descend into the black pit of despair, grief, anger. Jesus is shown as standing above the pit and his feet are resting on the limbs of the cross and he reaches down physically, visibly, with his right hand, takes the people by the hand and pulls them vigorously out of the pit and sets them behind, beside himself. That is the Eastern image of the resurrection. And as the icon shows it, 
there are many souls, persons who have been pulled out and stand around Jesus. It's also very noteworthy that in this image of the resurrection, there is a community. In so many older images of the resurrection in Western art, you have Jesus rising from the dead, perhaps all by himself in some modern versions, or at best accompanied by two or three. That's a very imperfect image. It reflects, I think, Western individualism. In the Eastern vision, the resurrection is the resurrection of a community empowered by the risen Lord. So that's what that means. Now, the important thing is, let me go back to when I outlined the problem in the first place, we in the West have found it easy to think of the passion, the death, the sacrifice of Jesus as what saves us. He saves us by making satisfaction for our sins, for example. It's a question of what you mean by save. Now, in the Eastern depiction, particularly in the very graphic form of the icon that I have just described, it's the resurrection which is precisely what saves us. Or the resurrection is very dramatically presented as a saving act. Jesus is pulling us out vigorously from darkness and death and sin into life, into life which is shared with the community which he gathers around him. So that's the second item in our Eucharistic prayer. If we go on, then it says, after we have recalled his descent among the dead, his resurrection from the dead. Note, it uses the word dead. It doesn't say a resurrection from death. The word dead means, again, the place where the dead reside. It's a community. So we start in a community which is alienated from God. We are raised by Christ in, as members of a new community, the community of the resurrection. And then we pray his ascension into glory. There are two themes in the scriptures associated together. One is exaltation. Jesus is exalted, lifted up. That's one part of the image. We see that notably in the Gospel of John. Jesus is exalted on the cross. And the other image is that of resurrection. Jesus rises up. You can see how they both fit together. Rising up, resurrection, exaltation, lifting up. And the ascension is a dramatic visual way of representing the completion of Jesus rising up. He returns to the Father. That is the first Eucharistic prayer. Now, if we follow through, we find that the, the second Eucharistic prayer, which is the one we hear most frequently, probably, unfortunately, that is not the most expressive prayer theologically. It's very short. And it comes from an ancient text from Hippolytus. But nevertheless, we find there exactly the same idea that um, 
we celebrate again his resurrection from the dead and his rising again. Now, among the four principal Eucharistic prayers, there is one which states most clearly and specifically that the resurrection of Christ is a saving event, and that's the fourth. Now, unfortunately, for very practical reasons, we don't hear that so often. It, it's rather long, but theologically, it is the most rich, goes right back to the ancient Eucharistic prayers of St. Basil in the Eastern Church. And I, I quote here, this is a summing up of the whole essence of what I'm saying from the fourth Eucharistic prayer. It says, to accomplish your plan, he gave himself up to death and rising from the dead, he destroyed death and restored life. So we can note some new ideas there to accomplish your plan. We found this idea in Jesus' account of the scriptures to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. All this is one plan of God from the beginning. And it is that which is accomplished in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So to accomplish your plan, he gave himself. This is again the theme of the giving of gifts. But now it says quite specifically that what he gave was himself. He gave himself. This is the, the basis of the idea we hear so often now, Christ's self-giving. And his giving is his giving himself in sacrifice and his rising from the dead. Then we have a very clear designation of the effects. He destroyed death and restored life. How did he destroy death? He did it by changing the very meaning of death. His own death, the death imposed upon him by human power in the form of Pilate and Roman force, was a death imposed to annihilate an opponent, to destroy an enemy. And everybody was a potential enemy. Christ, by dying, changes that. And death becomes extraordinarily no longer the annihilation of an enemy, but the emergence into new life of a new being, Jesus himself and us also with him. So he destroyed death and restored life. The life that we had lost by disobedience and sin has now been restored to us. And that is the life we live, and that is the life we experience. Now, I'll just go back now to the, there's two points. The most developed theology of the resurrection that I have discovered is in the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. So a brief note as to what St. Thomas has to say. He says that the risen Jesus, interestingly, the term he uses is the rising Jesus in the present tense, is acting to raise us up by the very same power that he was raised by God. extraordinary thought so that as I mentioned before when you experience the burning in your heart after receiving communion 
that is coming from the very same power that raised, raised Jesus. And St. Thomas says also, St. Uh, Jesus raised bodily, is raised bodily but no longer limited by the constraints of the body, space, time. And he says, the risen Christ acts everywhere and at all times. Now, when I heard the space story today, that, that, you can see the echo of it. St. Thomas is thinking of the, universe, the Christ acting through all space, all action, all power ultimately comes from him. So, St. Thomas, and then to conclude, we still have the, go back to the gospel scene. Why was it that the disciples couldn't see the resurrection? Well, they didn't have the faith, but immediately the problem was they didn't believe the women. The women had had a report and they had said, According to this report, Jesus is raised, he's alive. The apostles said, no, no, no. They couldn't see it. The women did. And that is the icon that I, I have there if it's shown up from the Eastern Church. It was the women who first carried the message of the resurrection. Certainly the women in the Gospel of, of Luke and then also, in a very special way, Mary Magdalene. These were the first witnesses who testified to the resurrection of the Lord. So a concluding note would be to re resurrect this idea of the Eastern Church. For them there's two images of the women. One is the women carrying myrrh to the tomb of Jesus. It's dark. They're shrouded in dark robes. They're sad. The second image is the one which I think is there, or should be. They are depicted as saints in the Eastern iconography. They wear regal robes because these were the people who first brought to us the message of the resurrection. So I conclude on that note of gratitude to the women, the myrrh-bearing women, and all the women who have followed them as witnesses to the Lord. Thank you.